I want to shift gears a little bit and to zoom in on the immigration issue. Uh, you also, during uh, last summer, uh, you vocally commented on the Southport incident and the following uh, mm. demonstrations and mm. riots. Mm. Uh, in Finnish press, uh, the, the happenings were described mainly as uh, inflamed by some single or couple of uh, mm. incidents, incidents of disinformation mm. and even Putin uh, and the Russians were, were mentioned. So w could you recap that whole incident and the background and basically mm. give, give your insights mm. on it? Well, absolutely. I think if you look across the West generally, we have two narratives that are going on. You have an elite narrative, which is voters are being swayed by misinformation, disinformation. They cannot understand what is going on in the world and we therefore need to limit free speech and free expression and the supply of information to try and control the conversation. And then you have what we might call a realist narrative, which is voters being entirely rational, coherent and intelligent, looking at what's happening to their societies, looking at what's unfolding and saying, no, actually, we don't want this. We want something else. And the Southport incident in the UK was really interesting because it revealed these two very different narratives. What the elite class tried to do very early on is say, well, this was about, you know, a guy went into a Taylor Swift dance class and he stabbed a lot of children. He killed three little girls. Um, he injured eight. He was the son of uh, Rwandan migrants who came to the UK quite recently. And what happened there, because nobody really knew who had stabbed these children, and there were some tweets that were suggesting it was an asylum seeker uh, and a Muslim asylum seeker, a lot of voters then began to protest and say, look, enough of, of immigration. And so the elite class then said, well, this is just about one tweet, misinformation. All of these people are far right thugs and we need to throw them in prison, which is exactly what happened. People that wrote things on Facebook, Maybe they tweeted something that was offensive or racist. They went to prison. I mean, an elderly lady who cared for her husband, who wrote something very offensive on Facebook, but in the privacy of her own home, she went to prison. They, they put her in prison. Um, now, where I depart from that, and I, I wrote a piece on my Substack, which got a lot of attention during the riots, where I said, look, this wasn't just about a misinformation story. This wasn't just about a tweet. What happened in the UK was a series of events, all of which highlighted the collapse of integration in our society because of mass immigration. We had two young Muslim men attacking a police officer in Manchester airport. We had a young guy from my, a minority background um, stabbing a British army officer almost to death outside of his home. We had the children of migrants running around a coastal town, South End on Sea, with machetes, having gang fights. And more generally, in recent years, we've had a number of prominent terrorist incidents uh, committed by asylum seekers um, and first generation um, descendants of, of migrants. And essentially, um, what Southport became was a lightning rod of that wider disillusionment uh, out there in the country, out there in the UK, of people who, to be frank, no longer feel safe in their own country because our borders have collapsed. We don't have a functioning border. And, and if you don't have a functioning border, you're not a serious country. Um, if you don't make people feel safe, we've got record levels of migration. And what these incidents all sparked in the country was a sense that this elite experiment of mass immigration is failing. And you cannot sustain what we have at the moment, record rates of migration with no integration strategy and hope to build a cohesive national community. It's not gonna happen. You know, to give you an idea, we've had more people come into the country um, in recent years than we've had between 1066 and the Second World War. You know, we're living through an experiment, which is what it is, it's an experiment. Nobody knows how this is going to work. Um, an experiment we've never had before in our history. So I went out on a limb and I said, look, the, these incidents are not just about what, what, 
you know, misinformation on social media. These incidents are about people who feel profoundly unsafe in their own country. And uh, a lot of people responded to that. And I'd only add that in the aftermath of that Substack piece, we had two major opinion polls and they asked the British people, who do you think is to blame for the riots and the protests? And they blamed rioters and they blamed far right figures, um, Tommy Robinson and so on. But 66% said, I also blame recent immigration policy. So two thirds of the, the British population were saying, I associate these disturbances with recent immigration policy. And to be frank, we wouldn't have figures in British politics like uh, Tommy Robinson or an entirely mainstream politician like Nigel Farage were it not for mass immigration, right? I mean, this underlines everything. And I just think there's a section of the elite class that cannot comprehend, cannot even articulate and, and deal with the fact that a large majority of people do not support this extreme policy of mass immigration because that is what it is. It's an extreme policy that is being pursued by an elite minority against the interests of the wider majority. Yeah. What I got from the Southport incident and its covering in the press was also this quite uh, clear double standards if you compare it to, let's say, the BLM riots. Or even if you just imagine how would the press have covered the incidents if we uh, change the, the skin colors of the victims and the perpetrator. Mm. I argue that it would have been just taken at face value that it was uh, a case of racism. And then we would have, have had a whole different discussion about it that didn't take place now. But well, can I just briefly on that, because sure. it's a very important point. Sure. We're now having a discussion about something called two-tier policing, two-tier politics, two-tier media. What we mean by that is some groups are treated more favorably than others. Yeah. And the Black Lives Matter example is very important because in 2020, we had Black Lives Matter protests during COVID, mm -hmm. during COVID lockdowns. Yeah. Sir Keir Starmer, now our prime minister, rushed to take the knee to express his solidarity with Black Lives Matter after they'd already injured 30 police officers during their protests, after they'd broken the law with the COVID lockdowns. Yeah. And Keir Starmer rushed to take the knee and he said, there are legitimate grievances here. This is about racial injustice yeah. because rioting on the left, remember, is the voice of the unheard. Yeah. This time around, the same Keir Starmer, despite us seeing videos on social media of Muslim gangs beating up white British kids on the street, yeah. walking around with knives and machetes. This time around, Keir Starmer said, this is all far right. This is not legitimate. It's criminality. Get these, get these people into prison as quickly as possible. There was no discussion of legitimate grievances. There was no discussion of legitimate protest. And in 2011, we had the worst riots in England since the 1980s under a conservative government. And at that time, everybody, everybody on the left fell over themselves to say, well, this is about austerity. This is about public spending cuts. This is about legitimate anger about this conservative government. So are there legitimate grievances or are there not? Because it seems to me that when it involves the white British majority and when it involves immigration, you're not allowed to protest. Mm. But if it involves austerity, public spending, Black Lives Matter, that's all entirely legitimate. And so what we have now are millions of people in Britain who are saying, actually, I think this is a two-tier, this isn't just two-tier policing. Mm. This is a two-tier political and social system that is routinely prioritizing racial, sexual, and gender minorities at the expense of the majority. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, about that, uh, I want to ask you about the future of democracy and, and within this kind of circumstances that, as you described uh, in Britain, the people have several times tried to vote against this historical experiment, as you put it, mass migration, in many parliament elections and then Brexit also. And basically it hasn't gone anywhere, so to speak. 
So not only are the people not allowed to protest, their voice has been completely sidelined even if even when they won't mm. uh, on on these is, issues. So my question is that how will you see this historical experiment producing this rapid ethnic change, rapid demographic changes in the population and still trying to keep up uh, as, as a democratical system. So in my mind, there's like a, there's like a clear contradiction and threat looming, sectarianism and so on. So how do you see the, see the future on that regard? Well, I think the elite experiment with mass immigration is undermining our democracy. 20 years ago, Robert Putnam, the Harvard scholar, pointed out that rapid demographic and ethnic change lowers social trust, lowers support for welfare, and leads to more divided societies. And I, I don't think you can look at any Western society today that is going through large-scale migration and think this is strengthening mm. democracy. Quite the opposite. What you're seeing is an elite class doubling down on its um, new religion, because that's what it is. Pro-immigration is a sacred value for the elite class. You're not allowed to question it. And many other voters are now swinging to a direct conception of democracy. They're saying, actually, no, we now want the majority will to be, to be respected. We want our voice to be represented and respected in political systems that only represent the values of an elite minority. This is where I'm worried about the state of British democracy. For 15 years, if not longer, there has been majority public support for reducing immigration and slowing the pace of cultural change. Yet at the same time, through that entire period, governments on both the left and the right, and the Conservatives are as much to blame for this as Tony Blair, Keir Starmer and the Labour Party, at the same time those governments have put the pedal down on mass immigration, taking us from a net migration rate of around 50,000 in the late 1990s to today, a net migration rate of around 700,000, which is unprecedented in our entire history. Our population is now growing at the rate of about 10%, which is unprecedented. And it's gonna get a lot quicker and a lot bigger. To give you one statistic from our government's own forecast, over the next 12 years, by the year 2036, 6.5 million people are estimated to migrate into the UK, which is essentially three quarters of London. Uh, we are going to need to build upwards of 500,000 houses every year for the foreseeable future, just to keep up with the demand from migration. Before you get to welfare costs, impact on crime and social disorder, impact on the economy, because the expert class who are blaming people for misinformation, for not understanding the issues, are also not releasing the data that we need to look at the impact of immigration on our society. This is unlike Finland, where you guys have some of that data and you can mm. crunch it. We, the data is being kept from us. We can't even look. Um, so voter disillusionment with democracy, with this notion of representative democracy, is becoming very palpable. Public trust in political institutions has never been as low as it is today since we've been recording data from the 1970s. People are turning to populist alternatives because they don't feel, rightly, that their voice is not present, not just in politics, but in media, in publishing, in cultural institutions, in creative industries, in the schools, in the universities, in the national conversation. You know, I give you a little example. If you're in the UK and you turn on the television and you watch a Netflix drama or you watch the adverts between a television show, they are all basically reflecting to you a political project, mm. which is that your entire national history, culture, ways of life are now going to be simply interpreted and repackaged through the lens of diversity yeah. uh, or a celebration of multiculturalism. Uh, now... As I say in the book, to say that a national identity is accepting of diversity is, is fine, but it cannot be the basis of a national identity because it's like saying you have no identity of your own. Mm. And many Brits and many people in England 
say, no, we have a very distinctive identity. We have a distinctive history, culture, way of life. We're the home of individual liberty. We're the home of Magna Carta. We are, you know, arguably one of the homes of parliamentary democracy. Uh, we have fought off every invasion for the last thousand years. We have a unique culture from Shakespeare to, dare I even say, Oasis. We mm. have uh, a remarkable way of life. We're a tolerant, fair people. We are distinctive. We are unique in our own way before mm. we even get to our remarkable history. What the elite class are trying to do is they're trying to wrap all of that up and either say that's problematic, it's, it's uh, racist, it's uh, in, it morally inferior, it's a source of shame, or they're saying well, you need to take all of that and repackage it as a celebration of universal themes like diversity and multiculturalism, which don't really mean anything. Mm. So people can sense this uh, imbalanced approach to multiculturalism. If you're a minority... You can celebrate your history, your identity, and your culture, and the state will allow that mm. through a policy of multiculturalism. If you're part of the majority, and you want to celebrate your distinctive identity, history, and culture, that is seen as being inherently problematic. It is, you know, the, the elite class don't really know what to do with that. Uh, you know, they feel very nervous about that. And that is what is driving a lot of disillusionment uh, and undermining our democracy. So there's the two-tier two uh, element creeping up again. And I think that uh, Mark Stein said one time about this diversity and multiculturalism is that it's basically saying that our core value is that we don't have any core value. Yeah, well, it's also a very hollow conception yeah. of who we are. I mean, Samuel Huntington made this point in his book, uh, Who Are We?, that... Uh, over time, what you have is not just rapid demographic change and uh, immigration. In the UK, much of it from outside of Europe. But you also have a, a denationalized elite, an elite that is, is not really interested in national identity. David Goodhart has called these people the anywheres. Mm. You know, they feel as comfortable in Paris as Berlin. And they feel They're cosmopolitans. Uh, but I don't even... I, and I think David's work is excellent. But there's, a, there's another way of viewing that elite class too, and he doesn't quite go as far as I would. Daniel Bell called them in the 1970s the adversity class, in that they, they derive their reputation by denigrating their own country. And you see this in the universities all the time. You see it in the commentators who are picked to speak at very important national moments. Uh, for example, the the recent passing away of the Queen, Elizabeth II. We now often have commentators who have written books that are very negative, a very biased interpretation of our history and of who we are, who are then pushed forward by a left-leaning media class to try and, again, encourage this re reproduction of who we are. And many voters are fed up of it, especially when it applies to their children.